Uh, welcome here to my session about SQL Server 2008 uh, database intervals. A few words about my person. My name is Klaus Aschenbrenner. I'm an independent SQL Server consultant uh, from Vienna in Austria. I'm an international conference speaker, which means I'm speaking my whole year, every day, almost every day, uh, about SQL Server. Like these days uh, here in Poland, I have done yesterday a uh, day long pre-con about advanced SQL Server troubleshooting. I've also written the book Pro SQL Server 2008 Service Broker, which was published by April in the summer of 2008. And further information about my person you can find on my homepage at sequelfashion.at and you can also follow me on Twitter. Okay, what's the agenda for the next 60 minutes? There's a lot of uh, things uh, to show. Today I want to talk about database intervals. I hope that everyone of you knows what the table is. Yes? In the table, we are storing our records, our records are storing our data. But how is SQL Server physically storing that data in our data file? Interesting question, isn't it? So we are looking on that question and I will show you within the next hour how SQL Server structures and stores our data physically in our data file. So the first step, I want to give you a brief introduction of the database structure that SQL Server is using, then we move on to demo metadata, then we talk about a concept called data page in SQL Server. When you have attended yesterday in a pre you already know that everything in SQL Server is about a data page. So when you are working with SQL Server, when you want to do performance tuning, troubleshooting, you have to know what a database in SQL Server is. And finally, <coughs> we are talking about the actual record storage in SQL Server. And I will also show you several limitations uh, that you will encounter when you have several crazy data designs, I would say. Let's start with database basics. When we are talking about the SQL Server database, a SQL Server database stores data. In addition, every database hopefully also has some indexes so that we can find our data very, very fast. Internally, SQL Server structures a database in storage units which are called pages. A page in SQL Server is always a storage unit of 8 kilobytes which means we can store 8 kilobytes on one page inside a SQL Server database. So when we are looking into our data file, our MDF file, we will afterwards see that that MDF file is just a set of 8 kilobytes large pages. Okay? That's the first basic thing that you have to know. That page in SQL Server is always also the unit of I.O., which means when you want to read one bit of information from a SQL Server database, SQL Server has to transfer the whole page, the whole 8 kilobytes, into memory, which is storing that piece of information that you want to retrieve from SQL Server. The same when you are changing data. When you are changing one bit, one byte of information inside the database, maybe you are doing an update statement, Insert, delete. SQL <coughs> Server has to write out the whole page, the whole 8 kilobytes where that information is currently stored. Okay? So when we look on our database, you can see we have several pages. Page numbers are always beginning by zero. So we have a zero page, first page, second page, third, fourth, and so on. It only depends how large your database uh, will grow. As you have seen, 8 kilobytes isn't really enough. We have already seen databases with 7 100 gigabytes of data. Few of you 
So we can imagine a page is a very, very, very small unit of that SQL Server, that the storage engine of SQL Server is using for storing our data. Therefore, SQL Server groups eight pages into a so-called extent. Okay? So every eight pages, beginning with page one to page seven, page yeah, page one to page eight, sorry, page nine to sixteen, every eight pages are grouped into a so-called extent, which means an extent in SQL Server is always 64k large. Eight pages multiplied by eight kilobytes. Inside SQL Server, there are two kinds of extents, mixed, mixed extent and uniform extent. Let's have a look on those. Let's start with a uniform extent. Uniform extent, again, consists of eight pages, and a uniform extent means that those eight pages are belonging to the same database object. Like a heap table, like a clustered index, non clustered index. And the mixed extent means that the eight pages of that mixed extent belongs to different database objects. Maybe the first page belongs to a clustered index of the table, second page to a non clustered index of another table. Okay? So we have to differentiate between mixed and uniform extents. So we can see our extent, 64k large, always consists of 8 pages, and each page, again, 8 kilobyte large. Why is SQL Server using that design or that differentiation between mixed and uniform extents? Every time when SQL Server creates a new database object. Like we are creating a table, we are inserting the first record into that table. Then SQL Server always, by default, allocates a free page inside a mixed extent. And SQL Server is doing that up to the eighth page, which means very, very small tables with very, very few records are very, very small on our storage because our tables, our indexes are only growing in 8 kilobyte units. Our table starts with 8 kilobyte, goes up to 16, 24, up to 64 kilobytes. And afterwards, when we name a ninth page for that table, for that index, when we need a ninth page for a database object, like an index or a bubble, <laughs> SQL Server allocates a whole uniform extent, which means our table, our database object, grows from 64 kilobyte to 128, to 192, 256, and so on. Why Microsoft has chosen this design? Microsoft has chosen that design in the last century, where storage was expensive, okay? <laughs> but that's a concept, uh, I think Microsoft has introduced it uh, with SQL Server 7, and these days storage is very, very expensive, and therefore Microsoft has decided that all new objects for a table always are created in mixed extents, okay? So the conclusion of that is, our database objects always have one to eight mixed extents and can have several uniform extents. Now we have our very, very large database file with our extents. Each extent contains eight pages. Now SQL Server needs some functionality to maintain those extents. Because when we are allocating new space in our data file, we have to know a few information. When we are creating a new, when we are inserting a new record into a table, and the table is smaller than 64 kilobytes, we have to find a mixed extent which has at least one free page. 
And when our table is larger than 64k, we need to find a whole unit from its stack, which also is currently not allocated to any database object. And for that two reasons, SQL Server is using two special pages. A GUM page, a so-called global allocation method page, and a so-called SGUM page, shared global allocation method page. Okay? Let's start about the GUM page. The GUM page just stores if an extent is used or not used. Which means is that 60, 64 kilobyte large block inside our NDF file allocated to a specific database object. A gun page it's a stores 8,000 bytes. Within 8,000 bytes, we have 64,000 uh, bits available. Which means with one gun page, SQL Server can cover a data interval of 4 gigabytes, which means the GUM page is always coming regularly after 4 gigabytes inside our data file. Okay? And our SGUM page just stores if that mixed extent has at least one free page available. And again, with an SGUM page, SQL Server can cover a data interval of 4 gigabytes. Here I've listed those bit settings, so you can see a GUM page, when the bit is set, this means that extent is a uniform extent and is not allocated to any database object so far. When the SGUM page is set when the bit, when the specific bit inside the SCAM page is set, this means that's a mixed extent, and that mixed, is, mi mixed extent, I haven't yet thrown something from that bubble, that uh, mixed extent, come on, please. Sorry, my It's a close. I hope so. It's the anticipation of it, I know. <laughs> so when the bit of the SCAM page is set, this means this is a mixed extent, and that mixed extent has at least one free page available. <coughs> as I've said, as I've said, those GUM and SGUM pages are coming regularly in a four gigabyte interval inside our data file. Okay? Easy, isn't it? So when you look into that data file, the SQL Server internally just implements a file system. Okay? So it's very, very easy also to parse out all those information inside our data file. There's one crazy friend from us called Mark Rasmussen from Denmark. Just Google for Orcup MPF. Orcup MPF. Mark has just written a whole browser with which you can read an MDF file of SQL Server without ever running SQL Server. Okay? Very, very easy with the information we can see here in the session. And of course, you need a lot of more knowledge. Let's talk a little bit about data metadata. As you might already know, SQL Server also stores table meta, table metadata in some uh, system views like SysTables, which contains all tables of our database, SysColumns, which contains all columns, SysIndexes, SysPartitions, SysAllocation units. So there are different uh, system views in the SQL Server which are describing on the metadata level of which components our database consists. Let's talk a little bit about sysindexes. Sysindexes is a great name. It has a confusing meaning inside SQL Server. Because when you have a table without any index, so a table without a clustered index, a table without any non-clustered index, sysindexes contains one record for your table. 
we have a jar, we have a table with other clusters in there, that's a so-called heap table, just a heap of unstructured data, then you will have one record inside the system analysis. Okay? In that case, a column with the name name has the one above, and the index ID is zero. Clustered index is always the index ID one, and our non-clustered indexes are starting with index ID two. Okay? So it's very, very easy when you look into these indexes to find out if you have any heap tables inside your database. So there are three possible scenarios when you will see an entry in a such as indexes. First, when you have a heap table, a table without any clustered index. Second one, when you have a clustered index. And the third one, when you have several non-clustered secondary indexes for that table. As I've said, non-clustered indexes are starting with index ID 2 up to 250. Then there's a gap between 251 <coughs> and 255, which is the sort uh, for Microsoft, it goes up to 1,005, which means uh, you have currently a maximum of 999 non-classed indexes inside the server for one table. Don't try it out. You will have serious performance problems when you have so many non-classed indexes. Okay? So a maximum you can you could see in these indexes a maximum record of 1,000 up to 999 non-clustered indexes and one record for our heap table or our cluster index. Okay, make sense so far? This mm -hmm. partitions. Who of you is using partitioning? Sorry, guys. Everyone of you is using partitioning. As soon as you are creating a table, SQL Server creates in the background one partition for you. Regardless if you are using partitioning or not, regardless if you are using standard partition or enterprise partition, your table will always contain at least one partition. Okay? We'll see that later. In SQL Server 2005, 2008, 2008 R2, we have a maximum of 1,000 uh, partitions uh, in SQL Server. As we have already heard today in Daniel's deep dive uh, keynote about SQL 2012, in SQL Server 2012, we have the possibility of 15,000 partitions. That's a lot. Okay? Inside one partition, SQL Server can store three different types of data. So-called inward data, row overflow data, and LB data. Inward data are all those columns with fixed length data types. Our inputs, <coughs> our charts, our date times, date times, and so on. All that data is stored in an in-row allocation unit. When you have variable length columns like far chart and far chart and so on, and those columns doesn't fit inside our database of eight kilobyte, then SQL Server can overflow that variable length columns to additional data pages. And those additional data pages are stored in so-called row overflow data pages. Okay? And finally, we have our LOB data pages, and on those data pages, SQL Server stores all the big data types. Those data types like text, index, image, XML, and function marks, function marks, SQL CLR, user defined data types. And when you are working with SQL Server 2012 with column store indexes, SQL Server will also store column store indexes inside that LOP database. So when we look on our table, you can see we have our table or we have our index, just of non clustered index. That table or index always belongs 
or always has at least one partition. And within that specific partition, we can have up to three allocation units. We have at least one who has an in-row allocation unit. Maybe we have a row overflow allocation unit when we have variable length data types, which doesn't fit into our main database where our record lives. And if you are using large data types for that specific table, then you have an LOP allocation unit. Okay? And now we just need to know which pages are belonging to which allocation unit. And for that reason, SQL Server is using a so-called IAM page, index allocation map page. With an IAM page, we can also cover a data in the world of four gigabyte for a specific allocation unit inside a partition, inside a table. Which means, when our data file is larger than 4 gigabyte, SQL Server creates a so-called IAM chain, just a linked list of IAM pages. One IAM page for the first 4 gigabytes of our data file, a second IAM page for the next 4 gigabytes of data inside our data file. Again, when the bit, when one of that bit inside the IAM page is set, this means that extent belongs to that specific allocation unit. The allocation unit itself belongs to a partition, and the partition belongs to a table or to an index cluster of non cluster. Okay? Let's have a look at that. Otherwise, you think I'm crazy. Not yet. <laughs> I'm creating a new database, creating a simple table. As you can see, I have only fixed blank data types. I have a char, an int, it's four bytes, state line means eight bytes. Only with that information, you can also calculate how large your records are. Okay? And when you divide, what, uh, when you divide 8 kilobytes by the length of your record, and you are up, or you are down, so if you are down, you know how many records you can store on one database. Okay? It's also very, very easy to find out or to make an estimation how large your database will grow. Sometimes people, when I'm doing uh, performance consulting, are asking me, how many rows I can store within a SQL Server database until I get performance reports. The number of rows doesn't matter. It depends how large your rows are. When I have a row which is only 20 bytes, I can fit more rows onto one database as I have a row which is 1,000 bytes long. And I can only fit two records onto one database. So when we go to these tables, you can see we have one record, this is columns, we have our columns, this is indexes. One record, when we look, just a simple table without a query <coughs> sequence link and this indexes shows us one record. That description is heap, index ID 0, and the name column now. That's a heap table. This partitions. I haven't done anything with partition. I've just created a simple table. I have one partition. Okay? So every one of us is using implicitly partitioning inside SQL Server. Because every table, every index consists at least of one partition. So when we copy that partition ID, it should be the same, yeah? And we go to system location units. We can see the current allocation unit, current allocation units which are belonging to that partition. Currently, I've only defined a table with fixed length data types, which means currently we only have an in row allocation unit. Let's alter the table and add a function column, a variable length column. 
let's go to this allocation unit again. And now we have to go to overflow allocation unit. And now I'm adding a stock panel in that tunnel, an LOP, uh, LOP data. And when we go to this allocation unit again, we have now three different allocation units. Okay, and for each of those allocation units, SQL Server has created one IAM page, and that IAM page is just tracking which extent, which 64 chunks inside our data file are belonging to that allocation unit. Okay, makes sense? Let's move on to pops. Sorry. Can I ask a question? No, you are not getting the model. <laughs> <laughs> not the answer to the question. You've just had that log pairs here. Yep. And I just think I'm going to put this question there for you. I think that's right. If you just go back to sys partitions, yeah. would there be a second entry in there with an end ID of 251? And when we go to spec this is conditions, mm -hmm. yeah. we have only one that's condition. Fine. Okay, that's fine. Cool. I just wanted to check something. Well, so you use the first page. Ah, so when we use the first page of the log, then we'll get a second entry as this partition. Mm -hmm. No, you will not get the No, no, no. Because the condition is above the allocation you're oh, then. Okay. okay. You also start getting out a new table when you're adding a partition. Okay. So let's have a look on our data page. As I have said, our data page stores the actual information that we have stored inside our tables. As I have said, data page is always 8 kilobytes large in SQL Server. The data page itself consists of three things, the so-called page header. The page header itself is always 96 bytes on the SQL server. Then we have the so-called payload section. Inside the payload <coughs> section, SQL server stores the actual data that we are storing in a specific table. And at the end of our data page, we have the so-called row offset array. We'll look on that later. So when we divide we subtract those 96 bytes from the 8 kilobytes, we get 8096 bytes. And from those 8096 bytes, SQL Server gives us 8060 bytes. <coughs> so our vectors, we can only store a record with a maximum size of 8,060 bytes when we are not using variable length columns. So when you are only using fixed length columns, you can't exceed the size of 8,060 bytes. Okay? Very, very important. So you can see, page header, always 96 bytes long. The payload, where our records are stored, and finally, the so-called row offset array. As I have said, when you're dividing those 8,060 bytes by the length of your records, you are getting the amount of records that you can store on one data page in your SQL Server database. Which means, when you have smaller records, you can store more records onto one data page, which means when SQL Server reads or writes one data page to our storage or from our storage, then SQL Server can transfer more records from or to our storage. Okay? So it doesn't always make sense to just create records <coughs> which are 8,000 bytes long. Okay? It doesn't really make sense. And it also means that we can store more data inside our buffer manager. As I said yesterday, in my brief time, the buffer pool is the main memory consumer in SQL Server. And the buffer pool just contains our data pages of 8 kilobytes. So when we are executing a query, the physical operator inside our execution plan goes to the buffer pool, asks the buffer pool, hey, die, 
do you have a specific page of that specific file for that specific database inside, inside the memory? If yes, we are getting immediately that page back. That's a so-called logic we need. And if not, the buffer pool issues a physical I.O. request to the storage subsystem, which is executed asynchronous in the background, which means in the meantime our DOE has to wait until that request is completed. And finally, that loaded page from the storage is put into the buffer pool, and the buffer pool returns that loaded page back uh, to the operator of the execution. Let's start a little bit about the row offset array. The row offset array is at the end of our database, and it always grows from end forward. Inside the row offset array, you are, get, you are getting a two-file entry for each record that you are storing on your database. And that entry just tells SQL Server where that record is physically located on that database. Which means our first record always starts at the offset 96, directly after the page header. Okay? Make sense? So with the row, the row offset arrays the only information inside SQL Server which contains the physical ordering of our records on our database. Okay? Let's finally talk about record storage. SQL Server has several special formats regarding record storage. The traditional one is the so-called fixed file format. That format is used by SQL Server, I would say, for our traditional table columns. So when we are using fixed length columns, variable length columns. Then we have also MOB data types. They have also a special storage format. That storage format is also used in the column store index of SQL Server 2012. And finally, when you are using or when you are working with sparse columns, those sparse columns are also stored with a special format inside your database. The idea of the sparse column is that the null value inside your table doesn't need any space. <coughs> For that reason, SQL Server stores a so-called sparse vector, and that sparse vector just contains all the columns with non-null values, which means any column which isn't part of that sparse vector is by definition a null value and doesn't occupy any byte of information inside our data file. Let's talk about that fixed file format. The fixed file format means that we are always storing in the first step, all fixed length data types and afterwards all variable length data types. So, for example, when we are creating a table definition, char, far char, char, far char, SQL Server stores char, char, far char, far char, which means the data <coughs> definition, the larger the data definition, has nothing to do with the physical storage, with the physical storage on the data page. Okay? SQL Server always stores fixed length data types as first and then all variable length data types. That's the format. Very, very easy to understand. At the first, you have two bytes where SQL Server stores status information, which type of record that is, and so on. Then we have two bytes which are just storing the offset to which our fixed data is stored. <coughs> because our fixed data has always the same length. And let's say I have two chart columns of 50 and I have a fixed length data of 100 bytes. And I have to add those four bytes, which means those two bytes are storing the decimal value 104, which ends here. Okay? And we have two bytes which contains the column count. The column count is needed for the so-called null bitmap mask. 
Now it would must just store which columns inside that vector and currently stored in now value. Okay? So when you have here the column count, you can also very, very easy calculate how long that uh, now it would must be. For up to 8 columns in our table, we need 1 byte. From 9 to 16 columns, we need 2 bytes, and so on. After the now bitmap mask, we have the number of variable length columns, 2 bytes long. And then for each variable length <coughs> column, we have one entry in the so called variable column offset array. Okay? So that entry for a specific column tells SQL Server how much data we have stored in our variable length column. For example, when I have a fracture of 100 and I'm storing clause inside that, I need 5 bytes, which means SQL Server stores that information inside that variable column offset array. Who has already seen a database or a table with a fracture of 1? Does this make sense when we look at that information? No. Why? Store small data when yes. store small data then we need it. Yes, because every variable length column has at least two parts overhead where SQL server stores how much data is stored. So for example when I have a function of one I need three bytes. A child of one just needs one byte. Okay? So that information can also help you to improve your database design. Okay? So it's not just crazy stuff. Okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah? There's 16 of them, I guess. What? So it's stored in two bytes. Well, they are stored in two bytes. One byte and the second byte. Well, yeah. And so, status of bit A is stored in one byte? No, there are eight bits inside right. that byte. So, you can keep 16 bits? Yeah, there are 16, set, 16 distinct bits which are stored in two bytes. Right, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. We can discuss this after. Yeah. How many seconds are there? Sorry? Let's say. It makes more sense when you do it with whiskey. <laughs> Come on. Let's talk a little bit about null values. Let's go back. I don't want to do 20 minutes so far. Let's imagine we have a char 100 column which is now label, and we are starting a now value. How much bytes do we need? Depends on data. Sorry? It depends on data. No, there is no it depends. Sorry. Just a clear answer. 100. 100? Sorry? So when we have a fixed length column which does a null value, then we need to store that fixed length data. So in case you have a chart of 100, SQL Server just stores 100 blanks. Hex code uh, 0 x 20. Okay? Only when you have a variable length column, that variable length column needs no storage. Expect those two parts. Okay? It's also very, very important. Some people are just thinking, okay, when I'm storing a null value inside, for example, a char column, this doesn't need space. No. It's a fixed length column. You're storing that fixed length column in that portion, so we need to fill in those values with just blank values. Okay? And the specific bit inside the null bitmap mask is set. It's a null value, but we have to store that fixed amount of data. As I have thought, or as I have already said, 
when we have variable length columns, and those variable length columns doesn't fit into one data page, then SQL <coughs> Server can overflow those variable length columns on the so-called row overflow pages. When we are only working with fixed manifest data types for a specific table, our table, our vector can be only 8065 as well. When we want to have longer vectors, larger vectors, we need to have variable length columns. And those variable length columns are stored off the original data load. So what SQL Server here stores is a so-called uh, row overflow pointer inside our original data page, which is 24 bytes long. Okay? So when SQL Server is offloading variable length columns onto server with other data pages, we are getting here 24 bytes, a 24 byte long pointer, which means there's also a limitation how many variable length columns we can have in SQL Server, up to 308, because our record here can only contain 8060 bytes. Every variable length column needs 24 bytes, so we have again a limitation of 308 variable length columns. The bad thing about that offloading is in the first step, when you are reading your record, you have more than one page file. You have to read the original data page and the world overflow data page. And the crazy thing about SQL Server is, when you have several variable length columns, it's not that the median stick, which variable length columns SQL Server is offloading to separate data pages. So sometimes a variable length column is stored in a row when it has place, when it has storage, and sometimes a variable length column is stored on a separate data page. Okay? <coughs> the bottle is still closed. <laughs> Fast was worrying me. <laughs> As long as I'm not falling out of the desk, everything is fine. So let's insert one vector and the second one. But then now what I now want to do is to dump all data pages. Okay? So I want to see the physical structure of data pages. I'm using here undocumented pronouns. Undocumented means not documented by Microsoft, but when we do the opt-in for them, we will find plenty of information. Mainly I'm using two comments, PVCC in and PVCC page. And with PVCC page, you can dump out an actual data page in SQL Server. If you want to get back results from PVCC page, you have to enable that uh, for Instagram 3604. The first step, I will execute in DBCC in, which stands for index, and DBCC in returns me for a specific table in a database of which pages that table belongs. And you can see here, DBCC in returns me to records, which means my table customers <coughs> consists of two pages. When we look on the table definition, you can see I'm just storing a few hundred bytes <coughs> in that table, which means for the actual storage, I just need one page for two vectors. Any idea why TPCC ends with those two vectors, two pages? You add another column. Hello? Yeah? The I am page. So the first page here, 93, is our so called I am page. You can see it here, page type 10 means that's an I am page, and page ID 90 has page type 1, which is a data page in SQL Server, page type 3 would be an index page, and you can see the I am page ID for page ID 90 is 93, so it's just a point to the I am page. Okay. 
So let's take a page on e marketing and call the PCC page. You have to pass in a picture name, the file ID, page ID, and the third or the fourth one as a parameter uh, which drives uh, the output of PPCC uh, page. For example, when you are using uh, the dump option one, uh, you are getting back the data in a more representative format. So, for example, you can see when I copy that out, you can see, for example, uh, we have our page header, we have our columns, and so on. For example, when we go uh, to page ID 3, uh, dump option 3, simply server also dumps out the columns itself. Okay? And dump option 2, that's the hard core one. We will get just back the data with hex values. We normally are using uh, dump option 3. Let's have a look on that again. So you can see we have the page uh, 90 in file ID 1. We have our page header here with some information. So again, you can see the page ID. If that would be an index page, you would see uh, the index level. You can see the annotation unit, the partition ID, index ID, object ID. Previous page, next page, but that page would be uh, part of a non cluster or cluster index in the lead level. How many records are stored on that page? How many free space we have on that page? That's the free counter, the free data, the LSN, the log sequence number, when the last time that page uh, was changed. Very, very important thing uh, when sequence number one is question recovery. Because based on that, that block sequence number, SQL Server can determine uh, if SQL Server has to do it going forward or go back. You can see the block bits, if that's a ghost record, and so on. But you can see we have here slot 0 and offset uh, 0x60 hexadecimal. In decimal, that would be offset 96, so directly after our big shadow. We have a length of 257 bytes. So you can see here, those are the first two bytes are the status bits. Uh, then we have uh, the two bytes uh, which are storing the position, uh, to which position our fixed length data is stored, and so on. And finally, uh, we can see uh, the data itself. For example, here you can see repeatedly uh, the value 20. Value 20 uh, is the hex code for blank. So you can see I'm storing here a uh, clause inside a column which was a table which was defined as chart 50, which means I'm storing here 45 blank values. It's a fixed blank column, so SQL Server stores 50 bytes, so the remaining 44, 45 bytes are just uh, spaced up um, blank values. Here you can see the decoded information, first and last name, and so on. And then uh, we have our second record in slot uh, number one, that offset uh, hexadecimal 161, then uh, 257 again. And at the end, when I'm using dump option one, <coughs> You can also see our row offset array. So you can see here we have two entries of our row offset inside our row offset array because our table just stores two records. You can see the first record starts directly at offset 96, so directly after the big shadow, and the second record stores at offset 353 which means uh, 96 bytes plus 257, uh, which is the length of our cracker. And what is also very, very interesting here, the row offset array always flows from the end forwards. Because otherwise, when you are just going forward to row offset array, SQL Server has to recalculate every time the row offset array when we are just inserting the record. 
so that could not perform very well. So for example, let's create that column butter, char, butter, char. These are the record. We <coughs> came from our data page, page 94, pump it out. As you can see, we have inserted values A, B, C, and T. And as you can see, C2 service stores P, T, A, and C. Okay? The C2 service stores are the first step, the fixed length colors, and afterwards, the variable length colors. You can also see very, very article that our fixed length columns are added with black values and the variable length columns are really only storing that amount of data that we have stored inside that variable length column with a penalty of two bytes that we need the variable uh, length offset away. Okay? <coughs> So let's create another table with the char uh, column of uh, which is now null label and the partial column which is also null label. These are the record. So the last two columns have the null value. We create the data page, which will be 110. Make it the CC page. And again, as you can see here. For our now column, which is a char column, we are again storing black values. One additional information about the match page number, page number 94, what does it mean? It's just the byte offset inside our MDF file, which means when you are multiplying that page number with 8192, which is the size of our page, you have the offset inside the MDF file where the page starts. So when you're opening the MDF file, for example, with the sharp application, you're moving the power point to do that offset. For example, 90 multiplied with 8192, and you're reading the next 8192 bytes, you have web page number 90 from the sequence of the database. Okay? So very, very from what to say, let me see. Another table, I'm actually waiting here, uh, says that this is IO, which we turn to logic and physical reads, for a given query, I'm creating here a table with, vari with several uh, variable length columns, so in that case, SQL Server can store two columns in our inward database, and SQL Server has to store the other two columns uh, in a row overflow database. Because our inward database can only store 8065 of information. Let's insert the record. When we now complete that record and we go into <coughs> our IO statistics, you can see we have logic reads of one. That's the, that is the database that we have read from our in-row allocation unit. As you can see, we have log logic units, which means we have read two row overflow databases. Okay? So our record now is now spanning across three different pages. Okay? Which means it doesn't really make sense to make records as, as large as possible because you just have to do more work in the storage. Okay? Let's start uh, the final step, a little bit about database restrictions. As I've said, when we're talking about fixed length columns, we have a maximum length of 8,065, which means our record can't exceed that limit. So when we are calculating the size of our record, we also have to calculate. Uh, we also have to include in our calculation the overhead that we have to pay for each record that we are storing in the SQL Server database. As you can see, 
we have a minimum of seven bytes overhead as long as our table has less than nine columns. When we have nine to sixteen columns with an overhead of eight bytes, because we need to keep bytes in the multiplet mode. Okay? So which means when we have tables up to eight columns, we can only store eight thousand fifty three bytes. So when we are creating a table which exceeds that limit, we're just getting an error message as you will saw. But children can creating a table with uh, 5,000 files, 3,000 files equals 8,000, 8,054 plus 7 bytes overhead would be 8,061. That's one byte uh, too much. So when I'm creating that table, we're getting a nice error message. Creating an ordinary table, blah blah blah, based on the minimum process, would be 8061, including 7 bytes of internal overhead. Okay? That's just the limitation of the design of the database. Because we're only fixed with columns. When we're creating, for example, here a bar column, bar chart column, everything is fine. Because the variable column can be offloaded to a different row overflow database. You have a table with nine columns, the size of that table, the size of each record, 8053 bytes, but again, one byte too much, because now we have an overhead of eight bytes, because we have to store two bytes inside the output that must, because we have nine columns. We need nine bits, so we need at least two bytes for those nine bits. So again, as you can see, error message. Okay? So, there are several restrictions when you are working or when you are designing your database. Okay? So, summary. What we have seen in the last 60 minutes, I have gotten a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> when, well, when we were in Dublin by the end of March. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the value of the process has also increased in the meantime because it's older. <laughs> A few weeks. Well as well. Yeah. Besides the bottle, uh, we have seen uh, database structure, we have talked about pages, extents, mixed extents, uniform extents, we have talked about GUM and SGUM pages, global allocation map page, shared global allocation map page, we have talked about Data metadata, very important concept here for me is system issues because every table contains at least one partition. And if you leave our partitions, we have our allocation unit, inflow, row overflow, and LOB allocation unit. We have thought about our data page, consists of three parts page header, always 96 by the SQL server, the payload. And finally, the world walks it away. Conclusion here for us, we can only store 8,053 byte long record onto one data page when we are working with fixed length columns. Otherwise, we have to use variable length columns. And variable length columns can be offloaded to other data pages, which means the performance will decrease when we are working with those data. Finally, we have looked on the actual record storage. I've talked a little bit about the fixed bar format, which means SQL Server stores all fixed length columns in the first place and afterwards all variable length columns. And when you have fixed length columns with now values, then those fixed length columns need your space because we have defined them as fixed length. Okay, so well, I hope. We have enjoyed uh, that session, and yesterday when we come, what else I have to say was nice to speak here in Poland.